Hi everyone, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival, and today we're going to discuss molecular orbitals. But before we can get to molecular orbitals, we have to first consider atomic orbitals, something that hopefully we're all pretty familiar with. So let's start with hydrogen. Here I have two isolated hydrogen atoms, and we know that each isolated hydrogen atom should have one electron located in the 1s subshell when in its ground state. And of course we know that these electrons don't move in perfect circles around the nucleus as I've depicted them here, but they do define a region of space defined by a sphere. But when two atomic orbitals combine to help form a chemical bond, something special happens. In the case of hydrogens, those two 1s subshells combine and form a region of space known as a sigma molecular orbital. And a sigma molecular orbital is a region of space where the electrons live generally in between the two hydrogen nuclei, screening the repulsive force that their positive charges have on one another. So they stabilize keeping these two nuclei close together. This is a bonding molecular orbital. But there's one rule that we haven't yet considered. And that is that the number of atomic orbitals going into an MO system must be equal to the number of molecular orbitals that that MO system contains. So our molecular orbital system is not yet complete in this depiction. We have one more molecular orbital that forms. That new molecular orbital that forms is called a sigma star molecular orbital. And it looks quite different from the sigma MO, doesn't it? If there were electrons inside of this sigma star molecular orbital, they would spend most of their time outside of the two nuclei, not screening their positive charge repulsions, and therefore would actually make the system very, very unstable. So let's think about what that means in terms of how hydrogen atoms come together to form a bond. In order to fully understand the molecular orbitals of an H2 molecule, we have to plot them in terms of energy. So here in this depiction, I've shown the two atomic orbitals here as these lines in blue. That will be our non-bonding energy. Unless there's an energetic benefit to forming molecular orbitals, these two atoms aren't going to get together and do that. So bonding molecular orbitals will be lower in energy and antibonding orbitals will be higher in energy than this purple line that I've drawn. So let's combine these two different atomic orbitals into molecular orbitals and see what happens. When this happens, we always get a combination that is sort of centric around that non-bonding energy. In this case, we formed two new molecular orbitals from our two atomic orbitals. One is the sigma, one is the sigma star. Next, we have to populate our new molecular orbital system with the electrons that we know the atoms are bringing to the party. In this case, one from each. When we do this, notice that those electrons go into a lower energy orbital overall, and this lowers the overall energy of the entire system. So this energetic benefit that comes from forming and populating molecular orbitals leads us to the prediction that hydrogen will form a bond to another hydrogen. But beyond that, we can actually calculate exactly how many bonds will form. We call this the bond order, and it's calculated quite simply, using the number of bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons, divided, of course, by two, because we know it takes two electrons to form a chemical bond. In our example here of hydrogen, we have two bonding electrons and we have no antibonding electrons. Consequently, our equation tells us that we expect two hydrogen atoms to get together and form a chemical bond with an order of one. In other words, a hydrogen molecule should have a single bond. And that is, in fact, exactly what we see. Now let's move on to the next element on the periodic table, helium. Now I've put molecular orbitals here in quotations because as we're about to discover, there really is no such thing as a helium-2 molecule. But to prove it, we need to use our energy diagram and combine the two atomic orbitals of helium atoms to find out what the energetics of bonding would be if it were to happen. 
So let's go ahead and do that now. We combine them into a system with a sigma and sigma star molecular orbital, and then we populate that system. Now in this case, I have two electrons that can fill the sigma bonding molecular orbital, lowering the overall energy. But I still have two more electrons that have to go into this new molecular orbital system. And they have no choice but to go up in energy and populate the sigma star. The consequence of this is that there's no real energetic benefit to bonding. So two helium atoms have no real incentive to get together and form an He2 molecule. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. When we calculate the bond order, we find that two bonding electrons and two antibonding electrons leads to a situation where we predict a bond order of zero. In other words, we don't predict a bond at all. And when we study helium in the laboratory, that's exactly what we find. Helium exists as isolated atoms. Now let's expand our discussion and consider the molecular orbitals of elements from the second row of the periodic table. We're going to begin with fluorine. Now fluorine, we know, has available p orbitals because it's in the second row of the periodic table. So atoms of fluorine have three different 2p orbitals to donate to forming new chemical bonds. And within those orbitals, we know each has five electrons. So let's think about first how those atomic orbitals combine and second how those electrons can populate the new system energetically to make something that's beneficial. When we combine p orbitals we find that we have a system that looks a bit different, don't we? In this case, a grand total of six atomic orbitals must combine to form a grand total of six molecular orbitals. Now the lowest and highest in energy of these correspond to the in-phase and out-of-phase overlap directly along the nuclear axis. Those we would call the sigma and sigma star molecular orbitals. But we have some new players here. Those are the orbitals that result from the side-to-side -side overlap of p orbitals that we call pi and pi star MOs. So we have to figure out exactly where the electrons will go in this system and whether or not there's a real energetic benefit to putting them there and that will help us determine whether or not fluorine will make a bond. Let's do that now. When we put all of our bonding electrons in, we notice that six total electrons go into bonding molecular orbitals. This is a tremendous energetic benefit. The sigma and the pi bonding MOs are completely filled. But fluorine has extra electrons and they have to go somewhere. And the next best available option is to place them into the pi star molecular orbitals. These are antibonding, so the energy comes back up somewhat. However, notice that overall, we still have a system in which, on average, our electrons are in lower energy locations when they're in the molecular orbital system. There's a little bit of an energetic benefit here. And our calculation for bond order lets us know that when you have a grand total of six bonding electrons and a total of four antibonding electrons, you would expect that species to form a single bond. And in fact, when we study fluorine in the laboratory, that's exactly what we find, a molecule with a single bond. Now let's move on to something a little bit more complicated. Here's another second row element, nitrogen. Nitrogen also has two p atomic orbitals available, but in this case, only three electrons in each. So let's combine those and form a new molecular orbital system. Now you might notice something changed here, right? Notice that the sigma molecular orbital is actually higher in energy than the pi. And this is an interesting phenomenon. It's caused by something called sigma pi mixing. And we won't go into great detail into it here, but I wanted to point it out because this is how you'll probably see it in your textbooks. Nonetheless, when we use the electrons from nitrogen's 2p orbitals to populate this new MO system, notice that they all go into bonding MOs. And better than that, there's nothing left. There are no extra electrons to fill in those antibonding MOs and counterbalance the energetic benefits. So this is a tremendously energetically beneficial arrangement. 
When we calculate the bond order of an N2 molecule, we find that having six bonding electrons and absolutely no antibonding electrons, we expect a nitrogen molecule to have a triple bond. This is a very strong bond, which makes nitrogen gas almost completely inert. And again, when we go into the lab and study nitrogen, that's exactly what we see. A diatomic molecule with a triple bond. Now let's consider one more element from the second row of the periodic table. This time we'll consider oxygen. And I promise, I'm not wasting your time here. We're going to see something new. Now, just like any other second row element, oxygens have available 2p subshells. And we know from their electron configurations that each oxygen contains four electrons in those 2p subshells. So let's combine them to form some molecular orbitals. When we do this, we don't see any real surprises here. Sigma, sigma star, pi, and pi star molecular orbitals form. Six atomic orbitals in, six molecular orbitals out. And if we fill them from the lowest energy to the highest, we notice that six of these electrons will go into bonding molecular orbitals, giving us a nice energetic benefit. But there are still two remaining electrons. And here's our new question. They clearly should go to the pi star MO, but should both electrons go into one or should they each take a separate molecular orbital for themselves? The answer to the question is rooted in Hund's rule and the Pauli exclusion principle. Electrons will try to spread out and maximize spin. So when they populate this new molecular orbital, they do so like this, raising the overall energy a little bit, right? not enough to completely counteract all of those bonding electrons. So there will be a bond formed here. O2 molecules do exist. But even more importantly than that possibly is this. Notice that there are unpaired electrons in this molecule. And that means that our new oxygen molecule is paramagnetic. Liquid oxygen can be trapped within the confines of a powerful magnet. You may have seen this demonstration done before. And of course, just as before, our prediction is correct. If we calculate the total bond order of oxygen using six bonding electrons and two antibonding electrons, we find that the six and the two leads us to a calculated bond order of two. Oxygen exists as a diatomic molecule with a double bond. So I hope that by now you're beginning to appreciate the power of molecular orbital theory. It not only confirms so many of the other topics we've already discussed on bonding, but it allows us to explain completely new properties that all of our other theories couldn't, things like the paramagnetism of oxygen. This is just the beginning of molecular orbital theory. You may want to consider in the future things like molecules that consist of two atoms that are not the same, or molecules that consist of even more than two atoms. There's much, much more to explore. But for this lecture, we're done. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. See you on the next video.